If the world from you withholds Of its silver and its gold And you have to get along with meager fare Just remember in his word How he feeds a little bird Take your burdens to the Lord And leave it there Leave it there Leave it there Take your burdens to the Lord Oh, and leave it there If you trust Him with your doubts He will surely bring you out Just take your burdens to the Lord And leave it there If your body suffers pain And your health you can't regain And your soul is slowly sinking in despair Jesus knows the pain you feel Well, He can say and He can heal Just take your burdens to the Lord And leave it there Leave it there, leave it there Take your burdens to the Lord Oh, and leave it there If you trust Him with your doubts Well, He will surely bring you out Just take your burdens to the Lord And leave it there Take your burdens to the Lord Leave it there Leave it there Good morning Thank you a lot, Andrea, for that. That was a wonderful, wonderful message. We load up on burdens that we don't need to keep because we ain't got no business dealing with stuff we can't handle, and he can. Amen? If you would, open your Bibles to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the next in my preaching series. also kind of lines up in some ways with Valentine's Day. Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Will you stand in honor of God's Word? Mark 10. 11 and 12. Mark 10, 11 and 12. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Father, we pray you guide us this morning in the knowledge of your word about the sanctity of marriage for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say thank you. Earlier in this passage, Jesus had been asked about the topic. Now, the context of that was that in the first century, basically in Jewish culture, this was a powerful debate. And so they asked Jesus about it, and it had been acknowledged that Moses had given a more tolerant view of divorce because men's hearts are hard. Uh, but Jesus said for his people, there was going to be another standard. We want to obey. Jesus. It's always, I think, important before we go into any study of what Jesus had to say about this sensitive topic to understand, like in everything, our reason is because Jesus died for us on the cross and rose again, and we want to love Him and obey Him. It's not just some kind of rule that we keep. Our relationship with Him is primary. All other relationships are or secondary. That's also another important thing to remember as we go in to this passage, and also that this passage, along with two in Matthew and Luke, 
give us the totality of what Jesus had to say on the topic, and we'll touch base on that a little bit during this time. The first thing that we need to say about this topic is that adultery occurs when remarriage occurs. Now, there are two sides to that coin. One is, as we'll see, it doesn't occur if remarriage doesn't occur, but also that it does if it does. The Bible says here, Jesus says, uh, again, we always want to stress uh, not some legalistic Pharisee, but Jesus Christ, our Savior, said, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. The Bible says that there, and there doesn't appear to be any biblical distinction between this adultery and other adultery. Jesus doesn't qualify it in any way. We should also note that in either case, forgiveness is available. There is forgiveness for everything if you're a believer in Christ. If you confess your sin and ask for forgiveness, He will put it as far away as the east is from the west. But repentance is always also in order. You continue, discontinue rather, the sinful activity. Perhaps, very quickly, that's one of the most difficult things for people to hear. I guess folk understand that if you are in a regular, if we can use that term, adulterous situation and you ask God for forgiveness, you should just quit doing it. But they seem to think that that's not necessarily true with remarriage, divorce and remarriage. Jesus says the sin's forgivable, but repent of the behavior. He also says here, though, that if remarriage does not occur, adultery doesn't occur. That's also important, I think, for us to understand. If you would, mark your places in the Bible and turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we'll return there a little bit also later. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let's look at verses 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. The Apostle Paul later is given instruction on this topic, and incidentally, that's important to see because there are some voices that will say, well, Jesus gave this instruction to them just as Jews, but it doesn't apply to Christians, but certainly uh, in the later post-resurrection era, but of course it does. Paul's talking about that in 1 Corinthians 7, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but in, if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. What Paul's saying to us there is that you shouldn't divorce your spouse, although, as we'll see later uh, in this context, there may be some context in which you're allowed to do that. But if you do, the expectation of the Lord is that you remain unmarried. That is something that's been hard to hear in the last few decades in uh, our Christian context. But it is what Jesus said. It is what the Bible says. Says It is the expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ, of Almighty God, that if you do, under most situations, then you don't remarry. Uh, in Matthew 19, 9, Jesus makes it clear that a man can divorce his wife for fornication. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 15, also in the same chapter, makes it clear that if someone's spouse leaves them because they're a Christian, then the Christian is not bound. That is, if your spouse leaves you God doesn't bind you. Let's head back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. I probably had you turn all the way back, and you won't have to do that if you haven't already. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. But if, he has said in this context, that if you have an unbelieving spouse and they'll stay with you, stick with them. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. In other words, the New Testament gives exclusions. Uh, there are situations in which uh, marriage becomes difficult, impossible perhaps to do. Certainly if you have a non-Christian spouse and you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, and they say, well, if you do, I'm leaving you, and they leave, God's not holding that against you. You have the freedom in Christ to move on with your life, and you've made a stand for Jesus that cost you a lot. You've put your, your relationship with Christ first, and your relationship with them second. You've done the right thing, and the Lord will take good care of you. But these are the only exclusions in the New Testament. Again, it shouldn't be seen in the context of legalism 
but rather obedience. Because you love Jesus, you want to glorify his name. Evangelist Bailey Smith, who's probably one of the greatest evangelists in the, around the Southern Baptist near the end of the 20th century, and I think he's still alive, but uh, he's pretty old by now. But Bailey Smith, in his book Real Evangelism, said this about the Lordship of Christ in general. Many have accepted an atmosphere of Christian culture rather than the Lordship of Jesus of Nazareth. They have the trappings of Christianity, but not the trust of Christ himself. They admire Jesus, but they don't really obey Jesus. That may be a very applicable comment, because uh, the reality is this. There are people that say, I love Jesus, I admire Jesus, but I'm not happy. I'm sure he'll understand. He doesn't say that he does. Uh, unless there are biblical exclusions, the Lord expects you and I for His glory to hang in there. But now let me say something else to you. If in any other area of our Christian life, if one commits in obedience to Christ to not abandon their marriage, He will give the ability to make that marriage work and be a joy. The day you say, Lord, this is hard for me, I'm not happy, I regret that who I... Maybe I should have married somebody else. But Lord Jesus, because you are my Lord, because you're my Savior, because you're the King, and because it would bring reproach on your name, I'm going to make this work. As long as that other person's willing to make it work and they'll cooperate, then that day is often the day that Jesus says, look how I'm going to make this work. Look how I'm going to supernaturally fix this situation. I would also say to you this morning, others could... Uh, perhaps uh, chip in, though maybe not just out loud right now, but people with long marriages may make it look easy, but it is not easy to do. Amen? Amen? It's hard work. As Christians, we shall all stand before Christ and to give an account. That's the most important thing, perhaps, before we move on to the next portion of this verse. Everybody in this room will stand before Jesus. And when you stand before Jesus, it won't float if you say, well, Lord, some preacher told me that it was okay. That preacher's going to be accountable to God for lying to you. Amen. But it isn't the truth. We all must stand before Christ. Secondly, though, this passage in the Gospel of Mark, as we return to our text, says that adultery can be committed against a woman. Now you may in our day think, well sure, that can certainly happen, everybody knows that. But in first century Judaism, that was a bit of a novelty. It wasn't necessarily the way they thought. The Bible says here that that's true. In fact, this element is unique in the Gospels to the Gospel of Mark. The only place that Jesus talks about that aspect of it is in Mark's Gospel. That's why we have to put all of what Jesus said together kind of to get a comprehensive whole of what he had to say about it. Women in the first century were relegated, particularly in, in Jewish life, were relegated to something of a low role in ancient society. But here their dignity is recognized. Jesus says this briefly. He moves through it quickly in his comment uh, to those who were listening to him that day. But it is a phenomenal thing. He's saying to men in that day, and remember, what generally brought this topic up was the fact that they debated whether a man could just put away his wife for any reason. If she burned the bread and he didn't like her, he found somebody younger he likes, maybe he could just divorce her. And others said, no, only if she's been unfaithful to the marriage, she's been impure, only under those circumstances. Jesus comes the closest on perhaps any other topic of just agreeing with one side against the other here. And that's been the context. But Jesus says... It's not just about you, buddy. If you divorce her and you put her away, you, when you go out and remarry, you're committing adultery too. The first century patriarchal culture uh, that Jesus lived in and did his ministry in, they would have struggled with that. But not only, though, is divorce a sin against God, Jesus said, it's a sin against women. Here's a place where you can agree or disagree. You can't disagree with the Word of God, but you can disagree, I guess, with this statement, but I think probably very few will. 
Often women suffer deep emotional and even financial catastrophe as a result of divorce. Amen? There are many, many women living in poverty who were seen by their husband as a disposable wife. Al Mohler writes, Americans have become so self-absorbed that you will find many people now saying, I divorced because I needed to in order to become the self that I needed to be. I, 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 I. And one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things that's occurring in our culture today in our increasingly permissive environment are there are men that marry a wonderful young woman and she loves them and him and she has his children and then his career advances and she sees him through perhaps the time that he's in school and he's in college and, and he's doing all this work to, to advance himself and then he gets to a position in his life and he says, hey, you know, I've come to the place in my life I can trade for a better car and a better woman. And that's kind of how he thinks. Amen? And Jesus said, we ain't having that. You've hurt that girl. You've done her wrong. But the Bible also says here that women also can divorce and are culpable when they do. This element, of course, also is unique to Mark. Uh, Jesus says not only is it a sin against that woman if you commit adultery against her and you put her away, but she also says that women have that ability also. Now, this is a, a, an element unique to Mark, and in the ancient Hebrew Jewish culture of the first century in which Jesus lived, this was a, a relatively uncommon thing for women to divorce men for simple, for one reason, for economic reasons. That would have been uh, doing themselves tremendous damage. It did occur some, but it was more prevalent, as we'll see later on, in the larger Greco Roman. Culture And Jesus says that that's a reality. But when it is, there is culpability, there is responsibility. Anything that we have the ability to do, we are responsible for. By the sovereignty of God, it's included in the New Testament. Perhaps for one reason, today in Western culture, divorce is often initiated by women. Uh, if we hadn't done so all, already, let's say something controversial here. Folks, it's probably pretty much 50-50 who the victim is, if there's a victim. Uh, it's, men have a tendency, agree or disagree, men have a tendency to say, well, women are all, they're just, none of them are any good. You can't find a, man, if I could have found a good woman, I'd have stuck with the rest of my life, but they're just all bad. And on the other hand, you see or some women say, boy, there are no good men out there. They're just all lazy. Well, the truth is, pretty much, it took two of you to get a divorce. There are probably exceptions to that, and God only knows, but it probably took two people to make it work or to mess it up, right. by and large. There's culpability for all. Immediately following this, Jesus blesses little children who are in fact so often another good reason to stay married. William Barclay comments about the culture of the time of the first century. He says that Christianity transformed life for the child. In the immediate background of Christianity, the marriage relationship had broken down and the home was in peril. Divorce was so common that it was neither unusual nor particularly blameworthy for a woman to have a new husband every year. In such circumstances, children were a disaster, and the custom of simply exposing children to death was tragically common. Now, you might wonder why I left that last part in the quote and did it, edited it out. Now, I almost did uh, this week as I was preparing this message, but it occurred to me that that's kind of what's going on today as well. We don't leave little children out and expose them after they're born. That is against the law, and you get in big trouble. But the, but the connection between the rampant epidemic of abortion and the rampant epidemic of broken marriages is definitely connected. Because, and I'm about to say something that, that, that might be hurtful, but it's said in love, because in either case, often, you don't care about your baby. You're willing to kill it. Or later, 
you say to yourself, well, the children will have to get over it. My happiness is the most important thing. No, it's not. The Amen. glory of God is the most Amen. important thing. And that little baby is very important. I say this in Christian love. There are times that in, in the power of God, through the power of God's presence, you have to suck it up and make it work and grow up. Amen. And ladies, it's especially important because we're focusing on you in this particular point. Think about those babies. When you're feeling hurt, uh, and again, if you're watching on television or on the internet, when you're feeling hurt, when you're feeling all self-righteous about yourself, and oh, how you should have married the, the guy that first, oh, blah, blah, blah. Think about the babies. Ladies, think about that. Not just our own real or perceived hurt. I've reflected on this a lot as a pastor because I've stepped down from this desk and pastor people. And I've reflected on this. It is very difficult sometimes to tell people what to do or to give them wise advice once there's a terrible situation. Once someone's broken their home and remarried and brought children into that home, now what do I do? It's a tough, tough, tough to give a good answer in a situation like that. But it is never tough to know what to do in the first place. In the first place, to make it work, to commit to what Jesus says in the power of God. I want to conclude uh, a very <laughs> short message perhaps. I want to include, uh, conclude this message with uh, something of a lengthy quote from a fellow named Stu Weber. But he puts this so well that I just want to read this to you. He says, see your marriage is a journey, not a destination. Because that is precisely what it is. In fact, marriage is not just your average journey. It's more like climbing a mountain. Together, early on, down in the foothills among the wildflowers, you start out side by side and hand in hand. But then the way becomes steep and barren. The flowers are far behind. There are a thousand obstacles on your trail. There are rocks to move and some huge boulders. You can't move without help. Get that help. Sometimes a season of bad weather comes along. and Both of you become weary and exhausted. As you cross one ridge after another, however, the horizon begins to open up a little. Whole new vistas come into view. Occasionally, you come to the kind of plateau where you can stop and rest, bask in the sun, and enjoy the view. Breathe in the fresh air. Unfortunately, too many climbers let their weariness get to their minds. They quit climbing. They become overwhelmed with the chill in the air and the grain of sand in their shoe. Complaining sets in, and they don't like climbing anymore, so they head back down the mountain, believing they would enjoy climbing better with another partner. They start the trail all over, rope to someone else, only to find the very same obstacles along the way. The rocks and boulders and bad weather still affect the climb, and now they not only have the obstacles to negotiate, they have to carry the weight of their regrets. But those who stick with the climb, hanging on to the hand of that original partner, these are the ones who move higher. Sometimes one has to carry the other, but their commitment to reach the summit keeps them moving. Together, yes, the sand still irritates, the cuts and scrapes still sting, but they've come a long way and they're not about to throw away the investment they've thus far made. Start over, not a chance. They keep climbing. And one day up on ahead, they'll reach the top, and there in another's arms, they'll celebrate the climb, sing to the world, and drink in the elixir of a climb well done. The view from the top will be full and panoramic, and hand in hand, they'll look back down the long trail they've ascended. From the top, it doesn't look so very far at all. The perspective will be altogether different. And those obstacles that seemed so overwhelming on an earthly day will have diminished in significance. Stay on the journey. You'll love the views ahead, the climb. All of life on a sin-stained planet is hard, but God is good. I'm going to read that again. All of life on a sin-stained planet is hard, but God is good. Amen. And one day... He will actually reward you for climbing well enough to reflect in your marriage his love for his own bride. That's a powerful statement, I believe, that Stu Weber makes. And the reality is this. Again, everything we say here 
spoken in love. But the reality is this. The devil doesn't show up in this or any other category with a pointy tail, cloven hooves, and fangs, and an ugly red demeanor. That's all Greek mythology put in with some medieval superstition and all cast together and we came out with that. And the Bible says that the devil appears as an angel of the light. The devil says smooth stuff to people. Like, well, you know that you could do better. Uh, you know that that person is not mean. Why? When she was young, she was pretty, looked like a Barbie doll. But after four of your kids, she doesn't look like a Barbie doll anymore. Well, son of a gun. He's not like he's not like the guy in the Harlequin romances or even the the, the cleaner Hallmark movie. He doesn't he's not always a, he doesn't come home every day and bring me flowers. Really, really. And gentlemen, you should. Ladies, you should take care of yourself. You should, everybody should be as unselfish as they can. But grow up. Amen. The devil will whisper in your ears all kinds of stuff. You are married to an imperfect person. I guarantee you she is. I guarantee you that. <laughs> That's the reality of it. And I don't say that to chide anyone or to certainly to judge anyone. But don't let the devil mess with your mind. Amen. I believe, you think of this a fair analogy or not, but I think that too often it's kind of like trading used cars person says, oh boy, I will get rid of that old clunker. And, and there's a shiny, pretty, the, the guy says that it's low mileage driven by a grandmother only to church. And it's just going to be, oh man, look how pretty it is. That's what I'll do. And there's nothing wrong with trading used cars, but I've traded some used cars and pretty soon I'm working on that one too. That's what you're going to wind up doing. Except it won't be with God's blessing. It won't pan out. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're straight with us because you love us, because you love your glory, but also because you know that the devil's lie is the devil's lie. All that's going to happen when we disobey you is pain and hurt and regret. I pray, Father, you change hearts and lives. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that was thinking about giving up on their marriage, thinking about how bad they've been hurt, and the whole litany of cruel lies and smooth lies of the devil, that your word will have just broken through, uh, been a godly, loving slap in the face of reality, and that, Father, we will say, to glorify your name, I'm going to be what you call me to be. In this area or other areas in our life, to not be deceived, but to be obedient. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, thank you.